Welcome to Wisdom for the Wilderness, a weekly podcast of Overland Church, uh, where the pastors of Overland Church will tackle tough topics, uh, topics that uh, maybe our people in our church have, as well as things going on in the culture. We'll celebrate what the Lord is doing at Overland Church, tell exciting stories about the people of Overland Church, and in a lot of ways, just use this as a time uh, to make disciples of our people. And so, man, welcome to uh, Wisdom for the Wilderness today. Uh, Josh, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about our vision statement uh, at Overland Church and kind of unpacking uh, its significance. Uh, you know, for me, coming into Overland in June, uh, this hopefully will be an educational podcast. Uh, and for a lot of other people who are new to Overland as well, who haven't quite understood the significance of this vision statement. Yeah, so let, let me just start off saying like what what this statement is. It's very simple. It's a very simple statement. We glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. That's it. We glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. Now, I think something that's probably interesting is you have been leading an organization called Gospel Life. Yep. And what is the mission statement of Gospel Life? Gospel Life's mission is we exist to glorify God by growing disciples who make disciples. And so there's a missions organization, and you hear uh, some of the same language there of what it means to glorify God. Yep. Um, you know, we say this is our like shortened mission statement, vision statement. We glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. And then we we kind of have these four uh, values that we use, proclaim, disciple, serve, and multiply. And really mm-hmm. everything in our church is built off of those four things. Proclaim, what, what, what does that mean? We're going to talk about that some today. Okay. Disciple, uh, what does it mean to make disciples? Uh, you say that in your in your. Uh, mission statement there, yep. like, you know, disciples that make disciples. What is a disciple? Um, serve. What does it mean to serve? Uh, who serves? Who should serve? Mm-hmm. And man, this Christian life is a life of service. You know, we yep. often say the greatest thing you can aspire to be is a servant. Yep. And then multiply in that element of uh, fulfilling the Great Commission and multiplying to the nations. And so mm-hmm. today, as we talk about our mission statement, I really want to dive into the biblical mandate to glorify God. Yeah. And, and what does it mean to glorify God? So, yeah. so that that could be confusing because it's not something yeah. that that we necessarily would use in a in our common vernacular. Yeah. Uh, you, we yeah. might say you're just trying to self-glorify or mm-hmm. glorification of self, but what does it mean to glorify God? I think that's a, a good yeah, question. I think um a lot of people they don't they don't go to a church looking to learn how to glorify God. Like that, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for something that will add value to their life. Yeah. And um, and so, you know, a lot of churches will cater to adding some sort of value to someone's life. You know, this is what we do. These are the programs we have, or we're going to teach you to be more successful in this area of your life. And, um, and it kind of, puts things upside down. Maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but, um, you know, if, if you don't approach life with this as your most significant motivator, uh, and purpose, then everything else is gonna, gonna fall apart and nothing else is gonna make sense. Yeah. Yeah. This morning, actually at, at my 6am Bible study that I have on Thursdays, um, we talked about the difference in identity and assignment. Mm. and where you find your identity and what it's it's rooted in yeah. versus your assignment, the things that you you do. And when you understand that place of your identity mm-hmm. in Christ, a child of God, a servant of, of God, adopted by God, like your identity is wrapped up in him loving and caring for you. Yeah. Uh, but then your assignment, becomes the part that most people cling to in life and they mm-hmm. struggle with. And mm-hmm. our assignment really is that simple. Yeah. It's to glorify God yeah. with our lives. Mm. And so uh, when we say we glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ, I think there's like two elements we need to really kind of break down. Okay. What it means to glorify God and what it means to proclaim Jesus Christ and how that gives him 
glory. Mm-hmm. I, I know that you are would, would be familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a catechism that was written in the very the, the very first statement is it asks a question. All the catechism goes through and asks questions. What yeah. is the chief end of man? Yeah, and the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Yeah. And uh, John Piper, of course, has done a lot on this in Desiring God and his other books. And if, in fact, John says, I've only written one book over and over again different ways because right. it's the same message. And he'll kind of take that back even one step further to what's the chief end of God. And that's what's become the chief end of man. The chief right. end of God is to glorify God and enjoy himself forever. And he created us to have the same sort of motivations and the same uh, fulfillment in in him that he has in himself. Um, and so we're that's part of being made in the image of God is reflecting who God is and enjoying him, worshiping him. Yeah, w- with with your whole life, with, with your, your whole life with, yeah. with your your whole being. If yeah. we think about what it means to uh, glorify, it, it's like to give weight, to give honor, to give the honor do his name. So if yeah. we think about glorifying God with our words, what does that look like? Mm. To to speak in ways that honor God and to to not speak in ways that dishonor God. So there's always a flip side on on both things and and so you know when we have kids and we're always telling them don't do this or don't say that or don't call names to your sister. I had that conversation last night. <laughs> like, you know, there there's that do not side um, right. But that's always paired with the do side. You don't call your sister names because she's made in the image of God. I mean, James talks about this. Yeah. With the same mouth, you dishonor someone made in God's image, and then you go and try to worship God. Yeah. It's incompatible. Yeah. 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 Can uh, and and then of course when it when he very when he gets there in three, you know, can uh, uh clean clean spring produce salt water? Can fresh water and salt water both or forth and yeah no it, it it shouldn't and so the things that we say as we live our lives our speech and man the tongue is hard to tame mm-hmm. but part of taming it is by making sure the things that we're saying are aimed at the glory of God and glorifying God I mean that's that's part of the Christian life is taming the tongue yeah. let me just ask a question let's just let's just wrestle through this for a second okay. if we're going to say the chief end of man is to glorify God What's the chief end of God to glorify God? Does doesn't it seem selfish of God mm. to say, "I'm going to glorify myself"? Yeah. Or, um, I want people to glorify me because if a human does that, yeah, yeah, right. We had this conversation a few Wednesday nights ago. Uh, JJ got in the car after trek, and I don't know what Chase was teaching about, but uh, JJ was like, "Is isn't it really selfish that God just wants everybody to worship Him and?" Like, well, bud, uh, let's think about this for a second. Is God worthy of that worship? I mean, yeah. that's what it ultimately goes right. goes back to. Right. Um, it's selfish of us because we're not worthy. But it would be selfish of God not to share himself through worship and not to be the object of our joy because he is the only true object of lasting joy. Right. So if he does, if he withholds himself in some way, and doesn't put himself at the center. That's actually selfish of him. It's yeah. the opposite, right? Yeah, right. It's the total opposite of us. Yeah. And, and and so much so much time of the human life is spent trying to glorify oneself. Yes, and uh, to bring glory to oneself. And um, it's a bad look, you know. Like if you're watching, <laughs> if you're you're watching an athlete. And they just think they're the stuff, and there's no yeah. humility in them. There's something yeah. in us that it drives us crazy. Yeah. We're like, God gave you that ability. Mm-hmm. But when someone first acknowledges that God gave them that ability, yeah, it kind of changes it changes their their yeah. perspective. And so yeah. I, mean, I think and this is why nobody yeah. likes Duke, right? That because the Duke Blue Devils, Christian Leitner, I mean, they are the example of that. Yeah, I would argue that's uh, <laughs> Nick Satan in Alabama uh, yeah. before he goes. You can tell uh, we're we're sports fans, and we have our our teams that that just get us. And congratulations to you on a Thank recent you. recent win. Thank you uh, over over Duke with your team, the University of Kentucky. I know it's a, a huge huge deal. Um, 
You know, here, here's what I would just say. Uh, we have to wrestle with that part of what it means to glorify God. And then the second part of that, that kind of uh, Westminster Shorter Chasm, because yeah. what does it mean to enjoy Him forever? Yeah. And we need to wrestle with, like, what brings us the best life? Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it is, it is the Lord. It is God. It is yeah. His kingdom. Mm-hmm. And, man, there's so much joy yeah. to be had in Christ. Yeah. And it is an eternal joy. It's not a joy that just goes away. So often we get our eyes. I'm going to talk a lot about consumerism in the coming weeks. Uh, just some stuff that uh, Thanksgiving's coming, Christmas is coming. Consumerism is a huge part of our culture, and we often just think if we get a hold of the next thing, the next thing will bring us some sort of joy. Yeah. And then we get it, and we have that little doodad, whatever it is, for a little bit, and we start looking. <laughs> for the next thing to bring us joy because it's not lasting. Yeah. But you really can have a life centered and rooted in the worship of Christ, the glorifying of God with your life. Um, and, it, and it can be pretty incredible. You know, if we open up the scriptures, mm-hmm. I'm sure you have some verses that you would go to that, that lean you towards glorifying God. I have some uh, yeah. The Apostle Paul had many yeah. uh, words about glorifying God. So, He's what are, looking over your shoulder, by the way? Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. All right, <laughs> uh, now I feel the pressure. Um, <laughs> that's just a picture. Um, <laughs> what are some of the verses that you would look at that you would say, uh, "Man, these kind of give me my marching orders mm-hmm. to consider God's glory, uh, to to glorify Him with my life." Yeah. So I. have I would go just first to the creation account and Genesis 1, which I've already mentioned, the fact that we are made in the image of God. Um, and this means that we we as human beings um, are, are unique creatures. You know, we, on Sunday morning, the, our dogs do not gather for worship. Um, good. I mean, I mean, we do have a dog or two that comes to church. But, that's true. But, that's but they're, true. They're but, service dogs, and yes. they are they are really service dogs and yes. trained. And we've I don't know if you know this, but yep. there's there's a young lady at church now training a service dog. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And it's that's been a pretty common theme in our church. But you're right. You know, animals yep. aren't aren't gathering to worship. Right. So we are are unique in that we have a direct relationship to God, and then we represent God to all creation, and that's why He says for us to have dominion. Um, over all of creation. And so I think that is just the the basic framework for what it looks like to glorify God. You have this, this you know, uh, vertical and horizontal aspect to it uh, where you're, it's your relationship to God, but it's also how you're living out that relationship in relation to all of creation, but then most importantly in our relations to to one another as as human beings. So that would be where I where I start. And then of course, you know, we've failed at that and the rest of the Bible is about how are we going to get back to being what God designed us to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um I mean you definitely see it uh with the patriarchs. Uh you you see it through the judges, you see it in uh you know, with Joshua judges, and then you you see it with the kings, mm. and and here's the reality: we're we've been talking about uh, Saul, the first king. We're going to talk about David. Uh, we're going to be entering our our next sermon series. Uh, it's going to be about the kings in the Old Testament leading up to Christmas mm-hmm. and the birth of the the true king. You're going to see that when the kings, when the leaders gave God the glory. Things went well, yeah. and when they didn't, it was disastrous. Yeah, I think one interesting episode from I think it was this past Sunday when Saul gives the unauthorized sacrifice. Um, that's just a an example for us of maybe what we're not expecting. So you you get it when you know you have a king that's worshiping idols and all these bad horrible things like that's not glorifying God. But you do have these repeated cases of kings that are trying to worship God, but they're not honoring God as holy and worshiping him the way he's ordained himself to be worshiped. And so you have Saul offering a sacrifice that he's not authorized to to offer. You have the same thing happening with Uzziah 
going into the temple, trying to burn incense, and the priests say, this isn't for you. He's hit with leprosy. You know, there, there's just this kind of pattern of, we want to glorify God, but we want to glorify God in the way we want to glorify God, not necessarily in the ways yeah. he's ordained for us to right. glorify God. And he has prescribed and ordained how we ought to to worship him, how yeah. we ought to glorify him. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think of the Psalms, and just over and over and over in the Psalms, we do see this idea of, of glorifying God, blessing mm-hmm. God. Yeah giving him the honor ascribed due to his name. Um, I think it's important for us as we worship to keep the Psalms a part of the worship service. Often mm-hmm. on Sunday, we start off with a Psalm of Scripture reading. Not, yeah. not always. We do it from other passages of the Bible as it relates to the sermon. But when I can, I want to bring a Psalm in that is mm-hmm. pointing to God's glory. Yeah. I often want our frame of worship, when we kick off and we start on Sunday morning, that Scripture reading is drawing our minds to the glory yeah. of God. Mm-hmm. When we talk about worship and what worship is, I, I use a definition, by the way, this definition is, um, I heard Vody Bauckham say it, okay. uh, I think in two, uh, probably like 2003, yeah. that uh, worship is taking our mind's attention and our heart's affection and placing it on the Lord for who He is and what He's done. And, and I think those components help us to really to really do that, to glorify God. When we take our mind's attention and we take it off the things of the world, and we're just kind of, in, we're coming into worship. I think this is true of your quiet time. This is yep. true of, of like when you open up the Bible. I think this should really be daily practice. Mm. But you're taking your mind off the things of the world, and you're putting it on the Lord. Yeah, yeah. And that has to be an intentional act because— the, yeah. the regular day-to-day stuff in life is going to make you think terrestrially, right? It's right. going to like put your head down right. and you have to intentionally kind of lift that head up and right. reframe everything. Yeah. I think that's what Paul's talking about when he's talking about the renewing of your mind, mind right? Yeah, And that's a daily thing. But then Sunday is when we get to kind of do that together yeah. corporately and say, you know, we're not alone in this as a body, as a family in this community, yeah. we're going to do this. We're going to live this way. You know, the, the title of this podcast is wisdom for the wilderness. And the wilderness is this idea we see uh, in the old Testament. We see in, in Exodus after the Israelites uh, leave their captivity in Egypt, they're wandering in the wilderness And they're waiting to get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. And so for the New Testament Christian, there's this reality of like, we are in the wilderness. This world is the wilderness. We're sojourners in in this strange land, this wilderness. Mm -hmm. And we are waiting to get to heaven, our our promised land. And Sunday mornings are such a gift and a glimpse when the gathered church gets together because we, we're coming out of the wilderness together, locking arms and putting our eyes together on on the promised land. Yeah, and and to add a little bit to that, we are in the wilderness, but we're also already yeah, that's in right. the promised land. Right. And that's the rea- the crazy thing about being a Christian is the already, already not, but not yet. yet. And so, you know, like in Colossians chapter 3, we are to set our minds on the things, things above, above where Christ is because that's where our life is. Seated with him at the yeah. right hand of God. Yeah. So we're here, but we're already there. And it's trying to kind of integrate those two things in yeah. this life um, that is that wisdom for the wilderness. Right. So we're saying we're taking our mind's attention and then our heart's affection and it, that's another intentional piece of of giving God glory is making sure that your affection is placed on him yeah not on the the other things of the world which end up being like if you keep your heart's uh, affection placed on other things they become idols mm-hmm. right it, it's yeah. an idol that's what it what it's become you're making that the thing the object of your worship and so you're giving glory to that thing. Mm-hmm. And that thing is going to let you down. Yep. That thing is going to crush you. Yep. Uh, those those idols aren't meant to, to have the weight of our, our worship. So yep. uh, part of like when we gather on Sunday mornings, 
we really do want to live out this mission statement. We want to glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ, and a huge part of that is in our worship. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the scripture we read, the songs that we sing, we want to make sure the songs that we sing aren't just always the popular, uh, newest, easy-to-sing yeah. songs, but they're songs that really are about the Lord and yeah. give give God uh, the the glory. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I could have, we we should definitely have another conversation about worship music yeah. and songs yeah. because it's not some old songs that people just hold in great high esteem mm -hmm. don't really do that very well. Yeah. And some new songs, uh, many new songs don't. Many new songs are man-centered. Uh, but we want to make sure our songs, then when it comes to our approach to preaching the Bible, mm. we want to proclaim uh, the goodness, the greatness. We want to give weight, give God all the honor, all the credit through His Word. And so when we step up into that pulpit, when we step up on that stage, I want to make sure that we're proclaiming Jesus Christ. And yeah. so maybe we should now, let's, have, let's kind of shift our conversation of why does proclaiming Jesus Christ give God glory? Well, first off, it's because of the person of Christ himself. So in John 1, Jesus is the Word, right, who has become flesh. And John says, in him we have beheld the glory, the glory of the only God begotten of the Father. So if you want to see who God is, you look at Jesus. Yeah. Um, and, oh, yeah. And, Come on. And, and Jesus is revealed uh, not just in the Gospels and not just in the New Testament, but in all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It's about who is Christ, promises leading up to him, and then the fulfillment of his actual coming. And so um, that's the only way to know who God is. And, and we can't just kind of like separate the God of the Old Testament from the Jesus of the New right. Testament or anything like that. If you want to know the God of creation, the God of the Bible, you look at the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hey, amen. That, and yeah. that's that's who we proclaim. I think the Apostle Paul um, in uh, Colossians 1, him we proclaim. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. Paul's saying, this is my goal of ministry. Him we proclaim. We proclaim Jesus Christ and him... Yes. Crucified. Yes. A stumbling block to, to mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we proclaim him, we proclaim Christ crucified. And we, we're, we're proclaiming the wisdom of that, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And yeah. so uh, we see that the, the proclamation of the gospel. Um, I believe it's at the end of Mark uh, when Mark gives that great commission statement. Mm -hmm. He uses the word, Proclaim. We yeah. see yeah. Uh, Matthew, the definitely the more common of the Great Commission statements. Yep. Uh, you know, go go into all the nations, pre preaching the gospel, mm -hmm. proclaiming the gospel, making disciples. It's kind of the idea that we get, but but we often uh, use that word, or that it gets um, shown out that it's it's Mark. That says a hey, pro proclaim this. Yeah. But then, you know, Acts chapter one in that great commission statement, be my witnesses. And so how do you how are you a witness to Jesus? You proclaim Jesus. That's a verbal witness to who he is to the ends of the earth. So right. um and I think that's assumed in the Matthew twenty eight, right? Right. How are you 100%. gonna make disciples and baptize them? Well, You've got to proclaim Claim Jesus them. in order to someone put their faith and be baptized. Right. You know, right? Yeah. Um, we want to do that when we gather in worship on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that when we we're, we're not preaching sermons that are centered on man. Yeah. Um, and man, that's a rub for some people because mm -hmm. some some people really are looking. It's it's not a bad thing to look of like how do I make my life better. It's not a, yeah. a bad thing to desire that. But I can give you seven steps from the Bible to a more uh, secure financial future, and you may leave going, man, that was good, but I did not meet your greatest need. Yeah. yeah. Your greatest need is not your your uh, checking account and savings account, mm -hmm. your Roth IRAs and your 401ks. That's not your greatest need. Your, yeah. your greatest need is to be saved from your sin. Yeah, and it, it becomes it becomes kind of a new legalism, doesn't it? Because it's like, well, these are kind of the new laws. These are the the tips that are the way to be successful. And go, do it, prove yourself. 
well, you're going to fail. Like you can, you know, if we're talking about being a godly husband and here are the four things you need to do, you know, have a date night and, you know, recognize, listen to your wife or, you know, whatever those things right. are, those actually become new legalistic standards apart from the actual yeah. transformative work of Jesus Christ. Like yeah. the only way you're going to be a godly husband and adopt these practices uh, in your marriage is first, if you have a relationship with Christ and your life is dedicated first and foremost to glorifying God. That's right. If you're doing this for the sake of having peace at home or uh, satisfying some sort of other desire in your life, yeah. then you're going to fail at, yeah. at these standards. And so it really yeah. ultimately doesn't meet the needs you're trying to meet by having sermon series that are totally geared in right. that direction. Now, all, all that being said, I think it's part of disciple making. Yeah, uh, I think it's I think it's part of teaching our our people, and it could be a number of things, but their stewardship or whatever. So we're going to do that, and we just choose to do that mainly by classes or yeah. in application points within a sermon yeah. that aren't. It's just not the main focus of it. The main focus we want it to be Jesus Christ and Him uh, getting getting all the glory, all the yeah. honor. But we also have the ability, and we as the church, I think we fail if we don't do this. It's got to be throughout our daily lives. Yeah, we're we're gathered on Sunday morning, glorifying God by proclaiming Jesus Christ, and then we're scattered uh, the rest of the week throughout the world to glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. And that doesn't just mean uh, if 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 you make that only about personal evangelism. And man, I think we ought to personally share the gospel. It, I think yeah. the Bible prescribes it. I think we ought to be faithful in sharing the gospel. I think many people are scared to do it. We need to be so comfortable. We need a gospel fluency. Uh, we need to be able to speak and talk about the gospel in such a way that it's just natural. That yeah. therefore, it, it's not. Hey, this is an organized. We're going to go out knocking door to door. It's that no, you're gonna you're gonna have lunch beside somebody tomorrow. Yeah. At, in the break room at work, and they're going to bring up something, and you get the opportunity to speak the gospel into yep. it. Mm-hmm. That you're going to sit down at a at a ball game this evening beside another parent on the bleacher, and they're going to bring up something, and you're going to be able to speak the gospel yep. into it. And mm-hmm. and you're going to see somebody that you know. I, I've just had this this happen multiple times in my life. They've seen one of the hardships I'm going through, mm-hmm. uh, the loss of my father, the loss of children, the loss of um, uh, my brother and, and they're, man, how are you handling that? Yeah. Well, guess what? That's my invitation to glorify God mm-hmm. because how am I handling that moment? Mm-hmm. Christ, Christ, yeah. Christ. And so I, I think we can't, we have to say as a church, as a gathered people and uh, ecclesia, right? A gathered group of people. We're going to glorify God when we're together by proclaiming Jesus. Mm-hmm. But we also have to be just as committed to glorifying God throughout our daily lives. Uh, Paul is pretty big on this, right? Um, this is First First Corinthians six uh, nineteen through twenty. He says, "Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You're bought with a price." So glorify God with your body. Mm. And so there's a holistic a, a, approach to that. We should we should for sure at some point talk about what it means to that your body's a temple and that yeah. you should take care of it. But the point of the body that he's given you and this life that he's given you is to glorify God mm. with it. So later on, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Of God, mm-hmm. I love how in that passage he doesn't take the the big things in life that that we would start with, you know, marriage and and parenting. Right. right. He he starts with the most basic things: eating and drinking. Like you can't right. get more basic activities than that. Yeah. So whatever you do, and and that right. goes back to you know kind of a conversation that we need to have around. Being thankful, right? Being 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 grateful, a level of uh, thanksgiving and gratitude. Because when we when we eat, whether we drink, we realize like these are blessings that come from God, and that 
in turn gives him glory. Mm-hmm. To say mm-hmm. it is it is the Lord that bestowed this to us. You know, we bless we bless our meals. Yeah. And yeah. we we say we say thanks or give give grace. And man, it's it's so it becomes this mundane task, but no, it really, really should be grateful. Right. And that verse is coming in the context of the discussion about uh, whether or not they can eat food offered to idols. idols. And so the issue is twofold, like, does this honor God or not? But also, like, how does my actions affect my brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, is it yeah. going to be a stumbling block for them? So um, that becomes a framework, right? In yeah. how do we glorify God in everything we do? There's there's that um, there's that vertical dimension. There's that horizontal dimension. Loving God and loving neighbor. You know, is this action or this activity? How do I do it in a way that loves God and loves my neighbor? If I if I figure that out, then I'm yeah. doing it in a way that glorifies God. Yeah, yeah. And we want to everything every part of our being. We want to glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. We want the proclamation of Jesus and who he is and what he's done to continually shape yes. uh, our hearts, our minds, as we give God glory uh, in all that we do. I mean, there's in whatever you do. So, um, again, if it's in your profession, mm. if it's as you raise your children, is in your even in your, your hobbies. Right. Uh, right. It's just who the Christian ought to be. We ought to have this uh, gospel goodness just ooze out of us. Yeah, I, you know, there's just so many people who have a disconnect between Sunday and the rest of the week. Yeah. And you know, if you are if you are I don't know an engineer, um, you ought to be a Christian engineer. That's right. And that doesn't just mean like annoy everybody with your Christian <laughs> right. music or whatever. But to how do I engage in this profession in a way that loves God and loves neighbor and benefits uh, the world and brings glory to God? Um, Every profession, um, every calling, every hobby, even there is a there is a way to orient yourself in that in that will glorify God. Yeah, we glorify God as we seek to, to shape our lives, to mold our lives completely around the Word of God. Because really, where do we learn to glorify God? It is the Word that informs and instructs that. And we have to recognize it brings glory when we, God glory, when we recognize that He is Lord of our life, that He mm. is the, the ruler, the sustainer. He's the King of kings yeah. and Lord of lords, and we live that way. Yes. Well, today, as we close, uh, Josh, do you have any closing uh, words of wisdom for the wilderness? Yeah, we, we kind of mentioned this already, but um, there's just has to be an intentionality. And um, and that starts with your daily devotions yeah. or quiet time, whatever you want to call it. Disciplines. I, yeah. And I, I feel like right now, if you get on Twitter or, or somewhere, some people will kind of devalue these kind of evangelical legalistic things they'll portray it that way that's not what these these are these disciplines of reading the bible and prayer are ways we ground ourselves in who we are and who god is in order to confront our life from that unique standpoint and if you don't take that intentional stance then you're just you're going to float wherever you know you you float without the direction that that you need yeah yeah, I, I would just say in in closing, you've got really two options. It's glorify you mm-hmm. or glorify God. And uh, glorifying yourself for the things of the world is going to leave you empty. It's going to leave you longing for more. But if you will live your life for God's glory, you will find incredible joy um, in, in life-giving, uh, invigorating life that says, man, I'm about God and His glory. Yeah. Hey, I want to say thank you so much for listening to or watching this uh, podcast episode today of Wisdom for the Wilderness. I just invite you to like or subscribe uh, to these channels so that you can get this content delivered to you every week. Uh, Know this uh, Overland Church family and others listening, man, you are loved by the Lord and loved by your pastors. Blessings. Blessings.